Good morning, everybody. I was asked a question this morning. Is Peter's lathe too tall for you? What do you think? <laughs> we'll be working like this today. Oh, very nice to meet you all. Very nice to be back here at this club. I had no idea how long it's been since I've been up here until they brought me up a couple samples that I did, I guess, when I was here the last time in 2008. I was going to say I've only been turning a couple years, but I guess I can't say that. A uh, couple, couple things about me. One, I'm a retired teacher also. Still trying to get retirement down pat. It's only my third year, but I think we're doing okay. First year was kind of tough. I'm supposed to be somewhere, aren't I? You know, that was weird for all the years of working. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a shop, old shop teacher. I taught that for many, many, many years to many, many teenagers. And we know all know how perfect teenagers are, correct? And they're always right. They taught me so much through the years. Bless them. Um, again, very good to be here. Um, I have a, a sort of a cheat sheet here for the day. Um, I know why Brian is not here because of what he sent me on an email of what he would like to see turned for today. And I got that email, and I scratched my head, and I said, man, it's been a long time since I turned some of those items. And one of them that really got me was this guy right here. And I said to my wife, I said, oh, I, have, I don't remember the last time I turned one of those. Well, it was 2008. <laughs> God bless Brian. He wanted to turn a coffee scoop today. So I had to remember how to do it. I mean, I'm, I, I know how to turn. It's what are all the steps? You know, 11 years is a long time. So I had to go up to the shop and prepping for, for this day. And also I just spent five days, uh, did five demos up north. And I had to squeeze one of these in while prepping the materials. Thank God I remembered the steps on that thing. So, for Brian, we will turn one of these today. But he also, uh, said he wanted an egg. He wanted a whistle. Somebody have done a whistle here? Well, I had to go digging through my old shop, looking for the whistle and all the stuff to, to make that. Uh, an acorn box, a tippy top, the top that you spin, and if all goes right, it flips over up on its handle and spins. And the off-center coffee scoop, and a rockabye box, which is a... Oh. Can we, is that Zoom, or...? Okay, this is uh, quite an involved little project. Some of you may have seen me do this before. Uh, it's got a lot going on. It's got spherical shapes in it, uh, crescents, triangle. It is hollow, uh, very thin lid, and the finial is an offset finial. And we'll go through making the chuck uh, out of some scrap wood to do the finial work here. It's um, quite a fun project. It was the project that I'm going to try to end with today. Now, they told me I had to be out of here by like 11 or midnight. <laughs> <coughs> thank, thank Peter very much for making the coffee to keep me going through the day. All that caffeine. <laughs> um, but that's the Rockabye box. But we'll get into that later on this afternoon. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to start, and I've got a few other little items here just in case I need to fill in a little bit of time. That was just a request from, uh, from Brian. Get that out of the way. So what would you like to see first? Everything? Yeah. Yeah. Your choice. My choice. Okay. I can't go wrong with that. Uh, to explain a little bit about my demonstration style, I try to teach while I'm making it. I don't just stand up here and turn wood. I try to explain what I'm doing. If I'm explaining too much, please let me know. 
if I'm not explaining enough, please let Jerry know. Uh, I also like interaction with you because uh, it's I'm here for you, and I want to give you what you what you want. Um, I like to have fun while I'm doing this. Again, retirement is supposed to be fun. Yes, it is. Some 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 work involved in this. Okay, I was going to start with a whistle, but I can't do that because the tool I need to make the whistle is inside the black box, underneath the brown box, underneath the turnings, underneath the paper. So I'm going to have to make another tool real quick. Uh, on here so I can do the whistle. So we'll start with a couple small projects. And one thing I do try to concentrate on is safety. And uh, so we, we get that covered up and the hair is covered up in the back. And everything I try to do on the machine is safe. It may look scary to you what I'm doing, but trust me, it is safe. I'm going to start with a very large stock of hard maple. And fortunately, on here, it has written toothpick. Okay, so it has to be in there somewhere. And I need, I need, that, I need that for my whistle. This is uh, probably about three inches long, nine sixteenths square. I'm going to take a knife, and I'm just going to chamfer the four corners on this. Don't worry, I did not carve off the tooth the word toothpick. What I want to do is I want to be able to just start it in the headstock. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Now I find this is all right to do when you're bor borrowing somebody else's lathe. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Okay. Now, the toothpick, when I started these, obviously it was before 2008. They brought me a sample of my toothpick back then. But um, the, the start of the toothpicks was we were having parent teacher conference night at our high school and usually I say I'm the Maytag man because nobody shows up. Well this strange night I had a mother, a father and their son come in. It was the only visitor that night right? and the son, I, his name was Ben and he comes in he's kind of one of those you know dubs and um, they were visiting some other teachers, so they just thought they'd stop by. And he was uh, dangling a toothpick from his mouth. Okay, and he took the toothpick out, and he looks at me and he says, Bet you can't make one of these. It had just come from Cracker Barrel. And they had this little finial on the top of it and everything, fancy little toothpick. I just, just didn't, didn't affect me at all. Well, the next day at school, He's there in class with his buddies, and we ended up with about five to ten minutes of uh, extra time before lunch. They were on their way to lunch. I said, all right, y'all come on over here. And I got up there and banged a piece of wood in a lathe and turned a toothpick. And that kid didn't say a word. It was just, hmm. And I looked at my watch, but we still got three or four minutes. Said, Let's go ahead and turn another one. Okay. Put another block on the lathe, turn another one. This time, I left a little tiny bit of wood at the end of it and shut the machine off, went down, and bit it off. I was the topic of conversation at lunch that day in the <laughs> high school. Don't you mess with Mr. St. Ledger. <laughs> he eats wood right off the lathe. <laughs> so I've been doing toothpicks ever since. But anyway... Go ahead and uh, I'm going for my tools and then they're not there. Now, I want to, um, throughout the whole day, no matter what cuts I'm making on here, 
I'm going to be using the ABC method of uh, cutting. And that is, one, I'm going to anchor the tool on the tool rest. That's for A. B, I'm going to ride the bevel on the piece of wood. That stands for B. C, I'm going to lift this tool to cut. And once I get it to start cutting, I'm going to follow through using ABC. I'm still anchored and I'm still riding the bevel and cutting at the same time. There is another way that I have heard to do this and it's called the ACC method. It actually works. I don't care for it as much. That is anchor, cut, catch. Okay. Uh, I do not care for that and I'm going to try not to uh, show you that today. Let's we'll start with making the working end of the vertex. I am cutting, not scraping. You can see the shavings coming off. I'm hoping this lathe is strong enough to make this. Okay, the tool is anchored, the bevel is riding, and as that bevel is riding, it's actually burnishing the wood. We'll make some more room so we can make a few more cuts. Get rid of these sharp edges. Okay, once I start getting back towards the headstock, I'm not going to be able to cut out here anymore. There's not going to be enough support for the cut. I'm already holding my finger on the back side of the wood so it doesn't vibrate. We're going to take it down to regulation cracker barrel size. You'll see throughout the day I enjoy using the skew. How many here like the skew? You don't mind a picture, do you? A picture? Yeah. What do you mean? Oh, sure. No, no problem. <laughs> um, so again, again, raise a hand who uses a skew and likes it. Not many. Not many. How many don't like the skew at all? I've never tried it. Never tried it? It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. I mean, I know you probably can't see it on the camera, but that's going to need very, very little sanding. And if I did that with a gouge, I would need to sand it. So uh, I, I suggest strongly uh, using skews. And be patient with yourself. They do have a tendency to want to do things you don't want it to do sometimes. You can actually make spirals and almost make threads with it by accident. Okay, back to the toothpick. Again, you will need to support this throughout the cut.
This is a piece of hard maple. There's a new tool on the market that I heard about, and I'm not too experienced with it. It's called sandpaper. Uh, does anybody here sand their work? One. Okay. Um, I try to minimize sanding as much as possible. I'm not fond of it. So I try to get most of the work done with the tool. So I uh, uh, pretty much don't have much sanding to do. But before I do the, uh, the end of it here, Some people are real fond of sanding. They, they sand a lot. My belief is, I don't, I don't know about you, but I think these tools sometimes get a little expensive. And I figure, well, if I bought that tool, I might as well use it. And if I bought the whole tool and I'm done paying the bank for it, I might as well use the whole tool. And you'll see that throughout the day. So we're just hitting that real quick. Does that look perfect to you? Okay. I'm going to need all the help I can get today with uh, with these projects. So he says it's perfect, so I'm going to go with him. So we're just going to do a little quick little finial on the top of it. Just a round over. A couple little detail marks. Go a little smaller with that. Just rolling that skew over for a half a bead. I was uh, had the opportunity a few years back to teach down at uh, Aramont School of the Arts, and I was up there at the lathe, and one of the other instructors. One of the other instructors came by and said, can you turn me a toothpick? So I turned him a toothpick, and at lunchtime, I gave him the toothpick. And he said, oh, that's, that's really cool. And his assistant said, I want one. And she said, but I want mine signed. <laughs> I came back at dinner, and I gave her a toothpick. I signed it. I dated it, and it was real tiny, but it didn't make the instructor very happy. He wanted his sign, too. Yeah, I'm just putting some little detail marks in here. Now, do you want to make a lot of toothpicks? Actually, I would suggest you do. The toothpick is not just a novelty to turn on the lathe, but it teaches you a great deal of tool work and a very light touch and a very sharp tool. I can't go in there and just dive into the piece of wood. It's a very, very light touch. And also the importance of sharp tools. Don't turn with two uh, dull tools. You know, life's too short for that. So there we have a little toothpick. And it just takes just a few minutes to make those up. Now I will need this for the next project for the whistle. So I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it around. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jerry. No, I don't. 
I use a bench grinder for the skew and the edge of mine, I have a radius in my skew, uh, which I just personally care, care for. A straight skew is fine, uh, but to get that radius on there as I'm standing and it's on a platform up against my wheel, I just rotate like I'm turning and flip it over and do the same thing. Now, right off the grinder, I think the skew is absolutely useless. You have to get a nice sharp edge on there, so I use a slip stone and sharpen that. And that, that grind on there is going to last me quite a while unless I drop it and get a ding in it. I'll just go back and hone it whenever I need to sharpen it up just a little bit. And I'm sure I will by the end of the day. I have to just touch it up with the hone. Um, and I, all these tools that I'm using today, uh, minus the one carbide tool I have, are all sharpened on an 80 grit aluminum oxide wheel. Um, and it does a fine job. Now, one thing I did not ask Peter about, and I don't have to, is a knockout bar. Okay, being a shop teacher with no funding whatsoever, you can see that I don't have much waste here on making a toothpick. I use everything. And do my kids, or did my kids, uh, make toothpicks at school? Yes, they did. They like, they like that. Okay, the next, according to Brian, is making a whistle. And I'm going to be using a homemade, shop-made jig for this. This is out of uh, some maple. And I turn my own number two tapers. And it's a jig for holding many different things. Um, I use quite a few of them throughout the day. But this one is for the whistle. It's got a 3 8 diameter tang on it, if you will. The whistle blank is two and a half inches long, three quarter square, uh, with a 3 8 let me get the angle here, with a 3 8 hole drilled down an inch and 5 8 And also, on my table saw, I cut a kerf in it at 30 degrees. You don't have to take notes on all those. It is on my website. Mm -hmm. Uh, an article on it that I had done and it can be a quick little project this you can't fail with a whistle I mean it's just you well I guess you can I guess you can blow it up but I mean if, if you don't blow it up you can't fail it's either going to make a sound or it's going to be a dog whistle <laughs> one the other so you know it's a win-win situation so this is going to go into the headstock here. And if there's time and you're interested, I can show you how to make a number two taper. You just let me know if that's what you want. I did bring extra stuff for that. For this, I am going to use support with a live center. First, I want to turn it into a cylinder using a roughing gouge. Anchor, barrel, cut. Now, a little trick. <laughs> You all probably already know is how to get a nice straight cylinder on there just eyeing it up and what I'm doing is when I'm holding my tool up here and my bevel is on here notice my left index finger it's actually up against the tool wrist once it's there locked in then I will just move my body over and I get a nice perfect cylinder if I came back here like this and my hand was back here at the end of the the tool shaft here, I'd have no control whatsoever, and I want to be in control today, so or every day that I turn. So bring that up. I only let so much out. My thumb is locking it in. The tool can go no further. So here we're quickly into a cylinder. Um, I'm just going to start shaping this with a cove on this end.
the shape is not important to make the whistle work. I'm using a piece of ash for this. Now you kind of don't want to get too happy. You don't get too happy with the tool here saying, oh, shavings, I like that. All of a sudden you're going to see a little black line appear and you've just turned into that 3 8 hole that you drilled in there. So it's just, uh, just a shaping there. We'll go back to the skew. Start shaping the mouthpiece area. Is anybody in here wearing a hearing aid today? Yes. One, two. Okay. There's a very good reason for me asking this. When we go to test this, unless you totally trust me and don't have to hear it, those with hearing aids need to be aware. I was in Ohio doing a demonstration. I think it was Columbia or Columbus, and uh, it was close to lunchtime. And I did a whistle, and they they didn't trust me. They wanted to hear the whistle. So I blew the whistle, and that whistle worked good, except for one thing. There was a gentleman about seven rows back was wearing a hearing aid, and he dozed off. He jumped so daggone high. And the audience did just what you were doing. I felt really bad for the guy. But he, he, he was shocked at that. So uh, just keep that in mind as we try this. The shaping, I mean, it can be anything on here you want. So I'm going to go ahead and just start cutting away back here at the uh, tailstock end. Now i got to remember I've got the point of the life center in here. Thank you. Pardon me? Okay, so far I'm good. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to put a couple little detail marks in here. Dress it up just a little bit. I'm going to use a piece of uh, formica countertop material and just do a little burning. Dress that up a little. Okay, with the skew I'm going to part this almost all the way off. Looks like I did not looks like I did not go far enough to get rid of that little dimple there so we're going to use that as an accent we meant to do that. It had busted off, just tore out the grain. It got a little, little ding there. And it's running a little off center, which is going to make it interesting. That's not very true. No, that doesn't work. I'm going to try something real quick here. 
Um, about half and half, I'd say. Another one that's uh, been quite popular lately has been the uh, the robust lives. Let me see the. So I did. Yeah, I just I just came back from a trip up uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Jersey, and Delaware, and I did five demos on five different lives. That toolbox was heavy because I had to bring three chucks. And accessories for all the lays. The one way I had the number three taper, and but I used a one way, a powermatic, a delta, a jet, and a robust, all all in those five different uh, days. Okay, I'm we're just going to sand this because if I put a tool on that, that's just not going to not going to work for us. Will being off center a little bit affect the whistle? Yes, it will. When you blow on the whistle, the sound is either going to go to the left or to the right, and that depends on how you position the whistle. And Peter, I was only kidding about your lay. That's fine. Nah, there's no excuse. <laughs> Sorry, bud. I was using the shavings that I had laying here. I told Jerry last night. You're going to be lucky if you have a dustpan full of shavings. Because he was asking me if I had materials for the demonstration. There's not going to be a whole lot. So, the body of the whistle is done, but the working part still has to be done. And that's going to make or break the whistle. And the fipple, the reed, if you will. I used a 3 8 dowel for that, about three quarters of an inch long. By the way, I don't want you to get worried. I am a firm believer in breaks throughout the day. I have sat in the chairs you're sitting in for many, many a demonstration, and I know after a while you start getting a little numb on certain parts of your body. And you need to get up and stretch or use the restroom or, or whatever. So we will take a break this morning. We will take a break this afternoon. And we will have lunch. So you'll have plenty of time. Okay, a fipple, fipple. A little piece of uh, 3 8 dowel with a sanding disc. I'm going to start angling this. The part that is at the very end here is going to be um, cut away, tapered, if you will, going uphill from here. So the wind, when you blow it, is supposed to go up that reed, cut across the curve that I have in there to make a sound. If you want a dog whistle, do not put the taper in here. Don't worry too much about this process. 
As long as you do it absolutely perfect, you'll be fine. You do know you have to tune a whistle, right? So we're going to put that in there. We'll go ahead and start out with making it flush. And also, you want to line it up so that taper is in line with the curve that you have there. How many say it's going to work? How many say it's not going to work? How many are too tired to raise their hand? <laughs> I didn't even get half on that one. We'll give it a try. Here you go, hearing aids. Good enough? This is why I needed the toothpick. If you don't glue the fipple in, you're going to end up, if you've got a long, strong one, uh, breath of air coming out there, you can blow that fipple all the way up into the end of it. So just get yourself a little glue. And let's see here. A little dab will do you. Trust me on that. It doesn't take much. Doesn't take much to hold it in there. Now, when I say a little dab will do you, I mean it. When we made whistles at school with the kids, they put too much glue in, and I'll never forget the expression on this one young lady's face when she went to blow on her whistle after she put the glue in, just to make sure it was tuned right. Bubbles came out. <laughs> she was shocked. We were laughing. She was laughing too. Okay. Ow. Do a little adjusting there. So there we have the working tool for applying the glue. Uh, adjusting the fipple, and you have a working whistle. So they, they go pretty quick. And I got that, still got that little dimple there on the end. And We're going to use lead to accent that. We meant to do that. And if I had a wood burner here with me, I'd go ahead and do a little biography work on the end of there. It's just a, a little a little blank there to play around with. So here we have the whistle. All right. We okay for another little project before break? Okay. How many here like spin tops? Yeah, pretty much everybody does. I've got probably three or four different style fence, uh, spin tops up here. Some of them are pretty quick to do. Some are not. Oh, Jerry, did I did I say you could touch that? No. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's that's pretty bold of you just to come up and grab it. Yeah. I mean, Y'all, y'all catch that? The uh, sanding disc that uh, he was thinking of stealing uh, is made out of MDF board and uh, PSA pressure sensitive uh, five inch discs, and peel it off, put another one on. Uh, also, I do some carving on some of the MDF. I'll put a uh, compound on here, and I can actually take my carving tools and sharpen them up on here. It works pretty well.
Where can I put this where he won't get it? <laughs> okay, we'll file that stuff there. I've got, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and do one. It takes, it takes a little bit of time. I've got some other quickies later on. And that is the tippy top. And the tippy top. is right here. We can zoom in on that. The tippy top. Okay. Now I'm out here. Okay. Straight in front. Okay. Here is a tippy top. It's not a very big piece, probably about an inch, inch and an eighth in diameter, but it is hollowed out. And one of the important things on here that I'll be talking about is the shape of the tippy top to get it to work. It's not perfectly spherical. And this is sort of, if you can imagine taking a ball of putty and from, from this height and dropping it down on your lathe bed, what's going to happen to that ball of putty? It's going to get squatty. That's what I'm after here on the shape of the bottom of this spin top here. Now you can get fancy with them. This one here is the same thing. Just did some pyrography work on it. It doesn't have anything to do with the working of the spin top. Um, just It's a nice piece just to decorate. So we're going to attempt to get one of these to work. And, uh, again, I'm lucky. It says tippy top on there. So that's what we're going to get out of here. I've marked the center from corner to corner on both ends so that I can put it between centers. Ninety-nine percent of the time, I use a safe drive center in my headstock. Very rarely do I use a spur drive. Unless I'm doing a larger natural edge bowl or something, I'll use one to grip onto the piece. But for 99% of my work, I use a drive center, safe drive center. And they're kind of cool because if something were to go wrong and your tool didn't you do, it'll just spin. If I had a spur drive in there, that's not going to do that. Something's going to come flying. Oh, yeah. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to turn this into a cylinder with a roughing gouge. Anchor, saddle, saddle. On the headstock end here, I'm going to use a parting tool and I want to <clears throat> turn a tenon. The length of the tenon is going to be approximately three quarters of an inch. <coughs> now that I have the tenon formed, I'm going to make a slight taper. I'll show you more about this later on today. Now, so there's the first start, five center, and wider as I go to the tail. What I want to do is I want to put this in the headstock and try it out and see how it fits.
Okay, needs to be a little bit longer. This varies on I've used the lathe. And some lathes, the milling of that number two taper is a little larger. Has anybody here ever used a stubby lathe? One? Okay, their milling of the inside of that taper is quite a bit different than other lathes. So I've actually had to add tape to my number two tapers with some of the stubbies I used. Good lathe. So if it's too small like that, all you do is extend your taper. Not a big deal. I'll have to remember that because I'll need to make some jigs later on if this is just a little bit bigger. Again, anytime you want to make one of these tippy tops or toothpicks that you have to bang the stuff in the lathe, just come on over to Peter's chef. You don't mind, do you, Peter? He'll replace the bearings. Not a problem. I'm going to use the part from the back for just one cent. I'm going to start working on the shaping of this tippy top. Make sure we're running through. With a spindle gouge, I'm laying that bevel on and I'm rolling this over. And I'll do the same on towards the headstock. And start working towards the squatty sphere shape. Okay, I'll finalize that shape here in a little bit. We're going to turn the handle first. It's going to be about a, approximately a quarter inch in diameter. And about three-eighths of an inch long. This is a parting tool I'm using, and I'm not scraping, I'm cutting with it.
Okay, let's finalize the outside shape here. My cuts are getting lighter because we're pretty close to where I want to be. And a little shear cut. The gentleman yawning over there, is that shape good enough or? No? Huh? You can't see it. It's right there. Okay, before I get too small there, while I still have some strength here, I can go ahead and on this. Was the question, what am I using to burn? Yeah. This is a piece of Formica kitchen countertop material. Just a scrap piece. Actually, it's one of the samples that you can get from cabinet shops. And it does a quick job of uh, burning those lines. I like using that as opposed to wires uh, on there. Um, this, no, no reason to have it. The only accident you're going to have with this is if you touch that after you burn it, it's going to burn you. It's going to be hot. Okay, well, I still have strength here in order to get this thing to work. Actually, I've got them to work without it, but is to hollow this out. Now, this is another project I made with the students at school, and I had to come up with something that would be user-friendly for hollowing uh, for the students. So I came up with this. which for some reason is, oh, I know why. Somebody packed my tools besides me up in Pennsylvania. The other shape I had, this is double-ended. I have a bedan on the other end. And this guy here is real good for hollowing small projects. Okay. What I did is a piece of quarter-inch high-speed steel. I put a spindle gouge grind on the end of it. And I also hollowed the top of this down so it's got a drop nose on it. And it's really a nice user-friendly hollowing tool for little projects like this. The kids loved it. With a square, it just lays flat on the tool rest. No rolling on it. Uh, roll of thumb for hollowing, and I'll talk about it later also, is my cutting tip I want to be on the center axis for this. My, tool, my kids at school named this the St. Ledger tool. Been using it for years. So we're just going to hollow this out. It's nice because I can go right down that handle wall. Peter, could you please tell me when I'm deep enough? Speak up so I can hear you, though. Has Peter said anything yet? Huh? Keep going. Jerry, if you start seeing silver come out at that end, you let me know here, okay? Somebody please wake Peter up. Wake up. 
We don't want it to go poof. That would make Ryan look bad. He goes to NASCAR races just to watch the wreck. <laughs> He's a real sick individual, isn't he? What, what, deeper, Peter? Um, he, God bless him. No, I'm not doing that to this top. No, uh, but I will say, I will say, I try to be a prepared demonstrator. So if the first one doesn't work, look at that there. It says tippy top. We got another one. I try to double up on uh, this. If I, hopefully I don't have to use them. Um, and I'll have them for another demonstration down the road. Uh, What's your drawing of the of the wall? To be exactly that thin. Um, uh, that's pretty much perfect. I'm saying probably about a little less than an eighth inch. What I want to do is I just want to get some meat out of there. And with that shape of that squatty sphere, what's happening is it spins. It's going to give it a little bit of centrifugal force. And start rolling up on its side, and if it if Peter has enough hollowed out in there, then it'll come up and spin on the, the handle. And, uh, so that uh, that's probably about three eighths of an inch deep or so, something like that. Oh, the instructions for this are also on my website on a little uh, little article. So now, before I sand it, I'm going to just start shaping a little bit. Yes, sir. This here, um, yeah, you can you can measure it. I I I am up because they may be off just a little. They're still going to work. Um, as far as depth goes in here, you can use a little uh, like anything. You use a pencil, and right there we have three eighths, and the handle, by gosh, is three eighths. That's just eyeing it up. For me, it's not uh, easy. I need to have the measure exactly. Okay, gotcha. So you have a little set of calibers, right, for the wall thickness? Yeah. yeah. That is not that important on this particular project. Actually, I want a little bit of mass down there. So as you can see, the shape we have here, I pretty much just went straight in with that tool. I didn't come out to the side too much. So I wasn't worried about busting it through. But I know exactly what you're talking about and use a set of calibers. Not that important on this little guy, unless it doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to continue with the spindle gouge and start uh, continue with the shaping. Now you notice when I'm up there cutting, I may look like I'm in a position, but when I start my cut, I put that bevel on and I start cutting and following. Than it is this direction. But the whole time I do that, I don't move my feet. It's all my body just coming around. And that's what's giving me a nice clean curve there. I do not do a whole lot of sanding on demonstrations. If this were going to be a finished, finished piece, I would go through all the grits. But during a demonstration, I don't sand for a whole lot for, basically it's boring to watch somebody sand something. If I went through all my grits like that rock -a box, that goes from like 220 to 600. 
And I probably, in those finished boxes, I probably got an hour, hour and a half of just hand sanding mm. on a back porch with a cup of coffee. I can't sand them much on the way. Okay, that, uh, that should be fine. Let's go ahead and uh, start getting that turned off. Now, take a break. I switch to a smaller spindle gouge. A little close to the headstock there. Again, I'm looking at the shape. I usually have more room to get in here, but since I had to turn that taper longer, I didn't have that much room left in the blank. And even my 3A spindle gouge is too large to get in there. So I'm gonna swap over to a uh, parting tool. On something this small, I see no problem whatsoever. I, and I don't use this technique on larger pieces. Um, it's only for small work that I'm using the tapers. Are you talking about what I have left on here? I'm just talking about the taper that's in the head stock and, and how big of a project you might. Where would you stop using I would probably stop somewhere two and two and a half inches in diameter on that uh, and not depend on that. I would go to a chuck. Right, the tailstock is taking the brunt of the pressure on that number two uh, taper. If it's a larger piece, then I got the tailstock on there as long as possible for support. And you'll see that in some of the projects this afternoon. Um, but that's actually pretty good fit in there. And you see me knocking it out with a knockout bar. I, I don't remember one coming out on me. I have seen them come out if it's, you don't make a true taper on there and it's just sort of flopping. You want it to really grab onto that taper that's milled in that machine. Uh, this is pretty pretty stout. Um, as I was saying, I, I brought a series of parting tools that I'll use throughout the day and I'll explain them now. Okay, I have two standard parting tools here. The first one right here is a quarter inch wide. That's for getting my tenons quickly on a piece. Uh, I have an eighth inch wide parting tool, um, half the thickness, but for more detailed work and getting into tighter spots. If those are too much, I brought two other parting tools that I made up, and I will use them. This is one, and for those of you that were at my 2008 demo here, um, this is the same parting tool and it's made out of a uh, kitchen table knife. Okay, it's a thin curve parting tool. Um, I'll probably use it on this right here. A couple things about this. <clears throat> one, if you go to make one of these, make sure you use a stiff knife. Don't use one of those flimsy ones. That's dangerous, make sure it's stiff. Uh, speaking of safety, if you're married, um, <laughs> I would suggest that you do this at night, um, which is what I did. You look over to see if your spouse is asleep. You quietly get up out of bed, you go into the kitchen, and here's another important safety fact. Pick the knife that doesn't match the rest, okay? My wife found out about this a few years later. <coughs> I didn't get in too much trouble because it didn't match anything. And I took it down to my grinder at about 11 o'clock at night and I sat it next to the grinder. Why did I do that? <coughs> I did that so I did not forget to make it. 
We see all sorts of good ideas as we travel around and see different demonstrations or read something. How many of them do we actually forget and never get around to doing? A lot for me. I'm glad I didn't forget this one. This is like 20 some years old and the one knife. So, you know, that, that's worked out well. Now, I've done a lot of demonstrations and presentations and it's been fantastic through the years with the invites and stuff that I get and people would invite me into their homes and cook nice meals and stuff. And all of a sudden, after a few years, that started tapering off just a little bit. I didn't know what was going on. I was still getting invitations. But we were going out to eat and not so much eating in their kitchens and stuff. I said, well, people, you know, something's going on. Well, I found out what it was. They were scared I was going to take their silverware. <laughs> yeah. Some, some rumor got out there. He, he takes silverware for party tools. So I had to go to other measures. So I went to Outback to eat. <laughs> and uh, a little bit of a heavier duty parting tool. And, uh, and, and again, I'll be using this today. I'll never wear that thing out. Uh, I did not steal it. I'm not a thief. I asked the waitress, what do you do with your old knife that needs sharpening? Well, half the time they go in the trash. So, whoa, you think I can grab a couple of those? And she brought me two, and I've got this one and one at the shop, and uh, I will never wear them out. She got a good tip. Uh, but it's good steal. Good steal. Um, but it's, well... Um, yes, um, I had a flat tool rest on my grinder, and what I did is I took out all the serration and got rid of that on both knives, okay. and once that was done and I was pleased with the shape, I rounded the edges so it wasn't sharp, comfortable on my fingers, then with uh, the V-groove um, base for the Veragrind uh, system, on the one way, I just brought this up to the wheel like so, and I flipped it over and went like so. And the same thing with the, uh, the knife. You'll notice that more is cut out at the top. This is the bottom, and that way I can get deeper in without raising up on the tool rest. I would not use, I would, if you are using the new diming wheels on your grinder, do not put these on there. It will gum up. It's not a high-speed steel. It's stainless steel, and it will gum up those. Um, okay. Now, this guy here, I can still lay it up against my piece like a bevel and follow through that shape. Grab onto it. Tiny little nub on the end of it. Is there a, a specific time, Peter, that you eat? Oh. I, mean, I didn't know if we were shooting. For, I'll, we were going to take a break, but I also wanted to make sure I was shooting towards a certain time for lunch break? 12 noon. 12 noon? Okay. With that answer, we're going to stop when I feel like stopping lunch time. Okay. So there you have the tippy top. And they, they take a lot less time to make than what I'm making up here because I'm trying to explain the stuff on here. So we got a toothpick, we got a whistle, we got a tippy top, and I know you guys are itching to take a break, and I know you trust me that this is going to work, so we'll just set that there. <coughs> I see it. I just showed it to you. You need room. You like my waist so far today? You need room to do the tippy top. <coughs> I'm just gonna come out here and see how we do. Yeah. 
I've got, I've got help. What's everybody standing up for back there? Did I do okay? There you go. You got the full action here. I will say they are a lot of fun, but I will say they're aggravating when you first start to make them. I've really gotten some people mad at me with these things. And they go home and try to make them. I get phone calls, emails, and they are just pissed off that they can't get it to work. And the main reason that I have found that they can't get it to work is the shape. They make it too spherical. And it's spherical, it will spin, and it will spin nicely. It will not flip over. So that shape is something you have to get used to on here. So what, what do you say we take five, ten minutes, something like that, and get up and stretch a little bit, and we'll come back and start something else.